So, good morning, everyone, and um, I'm Angela Martin from USAID. And uh, well, thank you for reading my bio. I, I'm going to add a few more points because I'm always struck by why, when they posed the question of what I was going to discuss with you today, I was a little curious because besides my background of being a development practitioner, I started doing this 30 years ago. Uh, managing agricultural extension projects for Peace Corps in Africa. So how I ended up here is a bit curious, right? Um, uh, don't worry, I, I did have about 15 years of, of working on CVE, so some of the security side has sort of worn off on me. I have a little bit of orientation. Um, but I wanted to, to just highlight this because I'm looking at this from a development perspective. I'm not a security specialist at all. All of you are. So I just want to remind you when I'm looking at this. Um, because uh, it, early on, and I've been working on this since uh, I think I started in the fall of 2005, before we even called things CVE, we called it counter-extremism, not CVE. Um, I, we really focused on trying to understand what is the role of development assistance. So we looked at the drivers. You've probably heard of this, the motivating factors, the risk factors. I'm, I'm sure you'll have other conversations. You've probably heard this discussed in your countries because over the years this has become an accepted terminology and approach. So what we would do is look at what was discussed, what are the factors that make people, particularly individuals, vulnerable to recruitment. And in the Sahel, we looked at the things that were just discussed. We talked, we looked at corruption, we looked at lack of social services, we even started looking at the psychology of, you know, sort of broken families, social, the social safety network, all those sorts of things, right? Um, and we looked at only young men, particularly. We did look at religion, we looked at radicalization, these points of the scholarships uh, and people going to study in Saudi or in Sudan. I mean, this came up when I was doing an assessment in, Niger in Nigeria in 2008, so, or Niger talking about as well. So this has been known for a while. Um, and, and, you know, the other side, so when we looked at sort of the idea is that you're looking at all these drivers to see what could be manipulated to have make someone to, so they are vulnerable for recruitment. Um, it's not that we didn't look at what the terrorist groups were doing themselves and their actions, but it was looked at uh, probably from our perspective, again, for us to understand what we would do more in like, uh, what areas are they operating in, right? So where was the attacks? Where were things occurring? Um, and so it helped us with geographic targeting, but we didn't really pay that much more attention beyond that. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, but over the years, and it continues to become even more apparent, that without a good understanding, as much as we can, of what the terrorist groups or the violent extremist organizations themselves are doing, um, we're, missing, we're missing a big part of the picture. You know, and in part, you know, there's an expression, two sides of the coin. Well, if one side of the coin is what are the drivers, what are the vulnerabilities, what are the risk factors in the community level or at the individual level, or even at the societal level. The other side is, what are the groups doing? Why are they operating? How are they doing their, what's, what's going on with them? We need to understand both sides because our, you know, one of the things, and this is logical to me, our, one of the core principles from the very beginning is an integrated approach. It's not just security response, and obviously it's not just a development response to deal with this. We need to work together. And if we're only, each of us are only looking at one side, it makes it even harder for us to work together and collaborate mm -hmm. and design it and, and, you know, a full response. Um, and so for me, I sort of came up on my, you know, this is my own way of trying to organize my thoughts, is looking at these groups, what are some of the things I can look at and how can I, uh, how can I think about it? So I came up with four aspects and I call it the motivation, the membership, the means, and the methods. Um, and you know, when I'm trying to sort of, again, go out of my comfort zone and look at what are these groups doing, trying to analyze the, the actual actions and how they operate. And so motivation going back was frankly one of the primary aspects from the very beginning of how we understood these groups and, and how we decided what was in our national security interests, what are the threats to the US and in our interests, and, um, and, and also to help us think through what are our options for the response. And why that means is because at the beginning we had two categories, right? One was the transnational terrorist organization that was trying to set up a global caliphate. 
I mean, I remember back in 2005, 2006, we had these maps that the military showed up with the caliphate all over North Africa into Sub-Saharan Africa, and here's what they're trying to do. Um, and, but part of it was that if you're trying to set up a global caliphate, they're not, there's no negotiation, there's no settlement, there's no grievances to address. There's no territories to hold except for this broad aspiration. Um, it's to disrupt Western influence, Western society, Western norms. So, so there was that sort of, there's no, there's no talking to them because there's nothing they want to talk about, them being these terrorist groups, the global jihad. Mm -hmm. And the second category is the one that is, it's more what we would understand as an insurgency, it's a rebellion, um, that, may, that have resorted to terrorist tactics as part of their overall achieve for political or uh, territorial gains. And so there were examples of that, you know, um, uh, the IRA, right? So that was, you know, we have, you have um, the Shining Path, you in Peru, you have the FARC in Colombia. So these are groups that are terrorist groups. They, ter they use terrorism tactics and tools but there is somewhere in there they started or there remains a political and even military objectives. And so this was a nice, neat division, right? You have global terrorists, the global jihad, that's who we're worried about, AQ, right? Um, and it seemed to work, right? You had, so thinking about in the Sahel, you had the GSPC who came from Algeria. They were basically a territorial insurgency, one would argue, who were terrorists. Um, but then they became branded, they shifted to being AQIM. They signed allegiance, they've moved over uh, to, they moved down into Mali, whether they were pushed or, or, you know, whatever the reason is, and they started having aspirations that were not territorial anymore. So it seemed to fit. And, um, um, uh, and that seemed to work for quite some time, but as was noted, you know, and just in the previous uh, speaker, that this line has blurred. Right, considerably. So now the motivation goes back and forth. Groups sign allegiance, but they're maintaining their territorial ambitions. Their, uh, um, you know, their, their, the role of where they are in, in a global jihad, particularly with ISIS, the ability of being a member and adherent is much less strict than it was for AQ that had some fairly clear um, qualifications and rules and criteria for being considered a full member. Um, and so, so I think that's made that distinction uh, harder for us, for the motivation. So, so it's blurred. The next one is, is membership. So who are the members? Where do they come from? Um, and again, you know, early on it was much neater. You know, when we started AQIM, because again, looking mostly at the Sahel, it came from Algeria. Most of the leadership, most of the membership were not sub-Saharan Africans. Mm -hmm. You had a fair number of Mauritanians, but they tended to be sort of spokesperson um, and uh, sort of senior leadership, but not the top. You know, and, and part of it, I lived in Mauritania years ago. Mauritania itself identifies as a Maghreb state, not sub-Saharan, and, and their historical uh, position as an Islamic republic and a seat of Islamic learning also lends credence that there's considered more of the Arab states in that sense. Um, and so for a long time, while there was some concern about recruitment, we looked at our programs, it really wasn't a big factor, to be honest. Um, obviously, as noted, this changed in the end of 2011 into 2012 with, um, with the, the Arab Spring, the fall of Gaddafi, and, but also that there was these, now there were groups, militias or rebellious groups that joined whole, the whole group joined. So what did that do? So now you're having recruitment that you don't have to recruit as a Malian or as a Nigerian to join a group that's run by, frankly, outsiders, right? Yes, it's part of the global caliphate and global jihad, but it's run by outsiders. Now you could be a member of a group with family ties, with clan ties, that's your familiar militia or your rebellion that can join in as a group. And so now you can, and that has changed. There's vast expansion of numbers. It's less about individual recruitment, although it's happened, but more about the group joining. And I think that pattern has con continued throughout the Sahel. We're seeing that with now the ISIS, uh, the expansion of Burkina, and how it's adopting with these groups there. I think the other thing that's a challenge is that what's been noted, and I'll talk about a little more, this idea of local militias that are protection, 
uh, slash response, and how does that uh, factor in trying to predict what's happening coming forward? Um, I think the other point is uh, to think about is the role of women. Now, we've talked about and we continue to think about fighters, but the membership, one of the things that AQIM did strategically was intermarry into some of these Tuareg groups, particularly in the north, early on. This was starting in 2010, 2011, even when they were just up in the, in the mountains, because they wanted to have uh, a stronger tie and a stronger base within the community. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's been really not looked at too much was what was the role of the women. And part of this is that, so the women intermarried, they actually were more hardliners and committed into the ideology behind these groups than some of the young men who just joined because it was fighting, it was something to do, it got, got me a gun, it gave me some standing. And this role of women as uh, facilitators is still very much marginalized as far as what is the importance of them. Are they running safe houses? Are they going shopping? Are they sort of the advanced watch? We don't really know very well how that's being done. What's being noted still is when they become actual um, uh, suicide bombers or actual combatants. And I think that that's a sort of a, a, a talking about a better nuanced understanding of how these groups are embedding themselves into these communities that we really don't have a lot of visibility on that. I think another point about the Sahel, compared to even much of Africa, both North Africa and other parts, is um, the role of the Sahel and the membership, whether it's a destination or an exporter. And it's really been neither. Um, there hasn't been a significant flow of the Sahelian, uh, from the Sahel out to um, Somalia, people joining, going out to go Al-Shabaab, and certainly not to Iraq and Syria. It's the same thing, the concern, while you do have return fighters, there is probably less of a concern if ISIS coming back to the Sahel, I'm not talking North Africa, than there is even for the DRC or in other parts of East Africa. And so this movement into the global sort of jihad or global fight, to use that and not that other term, is, is, is different in the Sahel and I think somewhat unique. Um, so, so going on to the, to the next one, which is the... Um, means and methods. So I think that can be in, intertwined a little bit, and again, we ta it was talked about in the previous speaker, is the idea of AQIM was relatively well armed, but it was a small group, right? And this was just, they had arms, they were fighting, and their, and their, their methods were mostly, frankly, kidnapping for ransom was their big, big attack, assassinations, and, um, and frankly, sort of conventional assaults against small military outposts to sort of maintain an operating environment rather than controlling territory. Um, and uh, uh, there may have been some opportunistic assaults to get some, some visibility, I would say. But for the most part in the early years, it really was um, uh, smaller scale, community level sort of skirmishes, military skirmishes, and kidnapping for ransom. Again. And then the flow of weapons that came in 2012 sort of changed the dynamic entirely. And the scale and persistence of the attacks uh, increased, although one would argue it still remained for the most part um, what I would call sort of conventional conflict and less about sort of large scale uh, civilian casualty attacks. Obviously that changed, there were a few spectacular uh, events that were done for different reasons in 2015 with the attacks on the hotels and even drifting south into the attack in um, Cote d'Ivoire. But it really was mostly, one would say, a uh, more conventional um, insurgency. I, I think one of the other things about the methods and means to talk about is, is the role of the criminal networks in illicit trade. There have been conversations back and forth about this, particularly in Mali, since 2012. I think we still don't have a handle on it, but I th for most cases, criminal networks are sort of a marriage of convenience. It's a way to um, move people and equipment. Uh, it can be a way of sort of uh, providing some uh, resources, but whether it's significant is, is unclear. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not a cause and effect. It's not something that's driving the way the terrorist groups are operating. Um, but it's certainly making the operating environment easier. I think one of the arguments is the overlap with corruption. How is this affecting the ability of security services to operate? 
what is the corrupting influence of the illicit trade to um, motivate or demotivate security services to contain the terrorist groups or to maintain the instability. It also complicates the idea of, cl of closing borders. You want to manage a border, you don't want to close it. The, um, the role of uh, uh, illicit, illicit trade, sort of the, the gray economy, is also becoming perhaps more important. I, I think one of the things, the issues, and we've heard this anecdotally, I was in Mali um, in May, was the issue of cigarette trafficking. Now, you know, in Europe, and just like in the US, a pack of cigarettes can now be upwards of almost $10. If you think about the potential for um, making money in smuggling cigarettes, it's probably more important than drugs again, and certainly easier, and going back to the traditional uh, start of Mokhtar Bal Mokhtar, who was a cigarette smuggler. So, so the, the illicit trade and how that's managed is also makes it very complicated. So its role is not very well understood. Um, the last thing I think, and then I'm just going to go through a little bit of how this has played out on, on, on the maps that we have of, of the uh, historical maps of, of the terrorist attacks over the last five or six years, is the role of connections between these groups. So over the years, where does, what, how has Al-Shabaab or Boko Haram helped, these, helped or hindered? What is their support? And now we would talk the global ISIS core. Um, and I would say for the most part, it was incidental. I mean, there was an infamous sort of uh, report of when the uh, fall, when the coup happened in Mali, that there was a Boko Haram uh, group of uh, training group in, in northern Mali. So there are connections, but I think it's been more about information, perhaps a few individuals, but it certainly hasn't been significant, and it hasn't been sort of a chain of command directions. Um, I think that's something that is still uh, being played out with ISIS core and what their role is. Um, now are they providing um, uh, ability to how to make a bomb, how to conduct an attack, but um, perhaps amplifying messages and their status? Um, it's unclear. I think some of it might be where there might be attacks so that there is, uh, we are here recognition in the global caliphate to sort of increase the stature. But whether it's tactically important in these countries, again, I think is, is probably not as important as it's sometimes played out to be. Um, so I just wanted to go through really quickly the um, slides to remind you, and I hopefully all of you have looked at, which sort of lays out about how the spread has happened. So in 2010, again, going back, this is really just AQIM, right? And there really is a small scale of attacks. It's up in the mountains, and this is where you're having the kidnapping for ransom. Um, going through into 11 and 12, now you're starting to see the effect and the spread in the south where you have the increased weapons. So again, you're spreading throughout Mali into 13. This is where you have basically um, more of what I call an active conflict. It looks like it's contained now in the Sahel, 14. 15, now we have the spread south again. This is where you have a lot of the mixed groups coming in. Um, and again, this is on the ACSS website. This data mostly is from another website called um, ACLID, which I think is very good to look at. And, and you really have to filter the data. I would take some time to look at the discussion. Because they also talk about political violence there, about protest, about riots. But I think it's very informative about going back to the point of looking at violence in, in general and not just terrorist violence and that, that uh, mix. Um, you know, again, going forward, you see now you see the rapid spread into Burkina Faso. And we're at 18, where we really have sort of the unfortunate, where you have the um, sort of the uh, violence that's being driven probably from community level um, issues and grievances and less about and being sort of co-opted and merged with the transnational terrorists. I think the, the last point, and I think because, you know, why we're talking about this way to understand this, I think there was the, the excellent sort of point from the previous speaker of you have to try to understand and maybe break it into parts to tease out what can be negotiated. You know, going back to that earlier division between transnational terrorism and sort of insurgency, what is there a political settlement? What are things that can be handled and managed to try to de-escalate the conflict? Where are areas to protect, to protect it from the spread? You know, one of the greatest concerns right now is, is this going down into what we call the littoral states? 
what's happening in Cote d'Ivoire, what's happening in, in a Benin, in a Togo. And the challenge is you do not want to have a response that's about terrorism only. You do not want to have just a security response because that tends to make it worse. Um, and so how can we help understand the motivations and who's joining and how can we get to negotiated settlements and leave the security response for the most narrow possible because I think that is really the way to prevent the spread and the way out of it. Thank you.